your credit score is going to continue to rise and you're going to get access to more and more credit. But if you have it, you know, they give it to you and you think, oh, I got $5,000 now. Well, you don't. You got basically an option to use $5,000 that if you use, oh, yeah. they're going to they're gonna charge you an arm and a leg for it. So credit can be a blessing and a curse. It can be a dangerous thing. You know, it can be a very good thing if you are disciplined and you choose wise investments to leverage, to use that credit in order to make you more money. But it's dangerous because if you have it and then you use it and then you don't pay it back, then those interest rates can be atrocious and you can rack up debt that way. To overcome, you must educate. Educate not only yourself, but educate anyone seeking to learn. We are all dead America. We can all learn something. To learn, we must challenge what we already understand. The way we do that is through conversation. Sometimes we have conversations with others. However, some of the best conversations happen with ourselves. Reach out and challenge yourself. Let's dive in and learn something right now. Today we are speaking with Michael Santonato, and he is a financial expert. He helps you plan your financial situation, get you the education you need and the heads up you need about what's going on and where you should be with your finances. Michael, could you please introduce yourself and let people know just a little more about you, please? Sure, Ed. Thanks for having me on the show, man. Great to be here. I like uh, I like the topic a lot. I like the content a lot. I'm Canadian, coming from Canada, but I'm actually in Mexico right now because I feel like Canada is a little bit like dead Canada. <laughs> <laughs> and, Welcome uh, aboard. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Welcome aboard to the dead community. <laughs> it's 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 interesting. I mean, you know, if you if you study, if you're aware, if you're awake, if you see what's going on, then you feel like maybe, you know, our countries have let us down. And one of the things people say is they say the system is broken. And I disagree. I think it's a perfectly well functioning system. It was designed that way. You know, it's not that it's broken, it's that it works incredibly well. It was designed that way. It's by design. And the way it was designed was so that the cream rises to the top and that the wealth gaps are self-reinforcing and they continue to separate. And the haves and the have-nots are this gap that's continually perpetually increasing because it's designed that way. The system's designed that way. Inflation is a tax on the poor. And those who know pay less tax. You know, the one percenters, the even the 10 percent, never mind the 0.1 percent, they know how to pay next to no tax. So... You know, the average person pays more tax than a billionaire. And that that doesn't that doesn't make any sense. But if you understand the system, it makes perfect sense. So yeah, then oh go ahead, Michael. Yeah, I just wanted to say what I do is provide a true financial education, the one that we never got in school, the one that we should have got. Um, I was lucky enough to have parents that were bank managers, and I'm the youngest of four kids. And they taught me everything there is to know about personal finance by the time I was about 18. And then since then, you know, in my late 30s now, I've just expanded on that continually and continually and continually. So that's what I provide people with is the financial education they never got. And and we don't. We, you know, I remember going to school and we, we got told how to write a check. Mm. You know, that's consumerism. Mm -hmm. but saving is a big part of this but you say to how do you put it protect your income with life insurance talk yes. to us about that what do you mean by that yeah the financial house is built like any house or building or office building or condo or whatever building you see they're building in your community and it starts with a foundation right the foundation in the financial house is your income. So if you're a father or a mother or a provider or you're taking care of your parents or your grandparents, 
everybody relies on your income. So your income is the foundation. The rest of the house is built on top of that, right? Providing shelter, food, you know, entertainment, uh, savings, and, and even providing for your own retirement, right? Those are all levels in the financial house that come after the foundation. So what the wealthy do is they buy tons and tons of life insurance and what's called income protection insurance or, or, or illness protection insurance. Because if you have an injury or an illness of any kind, then your ability to earn income will be hampered, right? It'll be hindered. And so what the wealthy do is as soon as a child is born, they buy all kinds of different life insurance, which are protection products. Insurance is protection products. So you make a deal, you make a contract with the insurance company that as long as you, you know, continue to pay this monthly amount, then should anything happen to you, whether it's death or illness or injury or sickness or an accident, then they'll pay you in exchange. So they've got 200 years worth of data. By the way, the insurance laws predate tax laws, which is why insurance is one of the best insurance is one of the best investments out there because it predates tax law. And if you get an insurance claim, then a lot of it is tax free, at least the death benefit is if you die. So the wealthy buy tons of life insurance when their children are born because they know that they have no crystal ball and they do not know what the future holds for their child. Should they contract an illness or an accident or a disability of some kind, whether it be learning disability, mental disability, or, or working ability, then they want to de-risk. They want to de-risk as much as possible. Because anytime there's a death or an injury or an illness, you know, the family has to chalk up money, right? My brother was just involved in an explosion in a in a big fire. And I'm, I'm flying back to Canada uh, in a few days, actually, I'm living in Mexico, I'm living abroad right now. Um, and I'm flying back to go be with my family. And so my family uh, is coming to my brother's rescue. You know, thankfully in Canada, a lot of the medical care is free, but all of it's not, right? They won't let him stay in the hospital forever. They'll kick him out at some point. They'll, he might require uh, home care. You know, he's got second degree burns on 20% of his body. So he's going to be bent. Yeah, he's going to be bandaged up for a while. And he's a carpenter by trade. So he might not have the ability to work uh, in the same capacity as, you know, prior to the accident. So his income might be hampered and hindered. And now you have some experience in that, right? Yes. So what, yeah, what that, happened to you? Well, just a simple slip and fall took my life away, you know, and that's how I felt. And, you know, if I would have known these principles earlier on in life, I, I'd be a different person today. But I, I don't really regret what I've been through. But Mm -hmm. Those injuries, they happen. I guarantee they can take you out quick. And it's it's ridiculous how easy it is. Yeah, it's it's true. You're right. One minute, you know, everything's fine. And the next minute, who knows? Yeah. Right. And, and the alteration to your lifestyle is dramatic. It, you know, because of that, I became homeless. I I lost all of my income. I basically burnt through my savings like it was not even existing there. Mm. And when you're in that situation, it's a bad situation. So knowing unpleasant. that, yes, mm -hmm. it is very unpleasant, especially when you've got wife and other dependents that depend on you. It's a bad yeah. feeling. You know, it, it was asking for assisted suicide. You know, that's how bad your emotional state gets. Even your physical body, your, your mental capacity breaks down your body along with your injury. So it, it's like compounding the issues. Yeah. When people are stuck like that and they have very little and they are experiencing, I need to file bankruptcy. What is some advice for that for people? 
Yeah. The average billionaire has gone bankrupt twice. So the first, yeah. So the first thing is to remove the shame and the stigma around bankruptcy and financial difficulty and hardship, you know, in other countries, in some Muslim countries that chop your hands off and stuff like that, if you can't pay your debts and pay your bills. (laughs) And, And in our Western civilization in Canada and America, we've got bankruptcy laws and tax laws to forgive for second chances because things go bad and businesses do fall apart and things do happen. Right. So, um, we've a big part is, you know, being in communication with your community, removing the shame, the stigma around, you know, bankruptcy or needing credit protection or credit help and things like that, because it happens all the time. You know, it happens all the time and we're not taught these financial tools or this financial education in school. So if you have to declare bankruptcy, then declare bankruptcy, you know, seek out professionals, talk to credit specialists or bankruptcy specialists. There's in Canada and America, there's different professionals you can talk to free consultations and just gather knowledge, you know, go on a hunt and just gather knowledge. But a pound of what is it? An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, right? That's right. So that's why having a financial advisor in your corner, someone like myself to go to and talk to is essential. Everybody has a dentist, you have teeth trouble, everybody has a doctor, you got sick or some symptoms you don't recognize, who are you going to talk to about money? You know, so having a financial advisor, a financial educator, somebody on your team, you know, like myself is essential to help guide you through those unknowns and those scary times and help you realize that it's not all the the drudgery and the drudgery that you have to go through alone you know you shouldn't be going at it alone you should be working with professionals who know the system who know what you don't know that i can fill in the gaps to help to get from where you want to be from where you are to where you want to be yeah well myself i i had to go through that bankruptcy deal and it actually helped me relieve a lot of stress and impossibilities that were mounting so it does take away a lot now you mentioned just a few minutes ago credit protection systems Mm -hmm. or credit counseling i actually looked at that when i was i believe 18 19 years old and that was a while ago has that evolved and how, how does that work nowadays yeah, it it has evolved. I don't know how old you are now, but it's it's always evolving and it has evolved. Um, I know that, you know, there are insurance companies that you can purchase debt protection products so that should you have an illness or an Ill injury or an accident or something like that, then the insurance company will will pay off your debts. You know, there's everything from mortgage insurance to debt debt protection insurance. Um, you know, your credit card company, even I'm not a fan of these, but your credit card company as well. Uh, a lot of the times they sell you an extra, you know, insurance product that we say no a lot of the times. But even that's a very basic form where they'll pay your debts or your credit card bills, you know, should you have an accident or an injury. Every company is different. You got to look into it. But I'm sure everybody who's got who's got a credit card could just call them up and say, hey, what are your uh, what are your debt protection you know, products or or add-ons. And so again, you got to go back to like prevention. It's worth knowing and researching and learning beforehand in order to get ahead and be ahead for the future. And I always love working with independent insurance companies because they often have what's called a rider, which is an add-on, which is like, you know, do you want fries with that? Um, Where for a little bit more, a couple of bucks more every month, they'll give you an add-on or a rider for debt protection or credit protection on top of your life insurance or on top of your sickness uh, protection product, for example. Interesting. And if you, some of them, it gets even better, Ed. Some of them, if you don't use it, let's say you live a long, healthy, happy life and you don't use it, then at the age of like 75 or 65, if you've never used that benefit, then they'll give you a refund of your money back on that portion. So you, there's wow. no loss. Yeah, so there's no loss. That's, that's interesting. You know, I, I recently talked with uh, Tom Basie, and we were talking about uh, insurance for long ter- long-term care. 
Mm -hmm. And it's amazing how cheap you can get these policies for and the coverage that they write. And, mm -hmm. and he is an independent insurance dealer. Very interesting. Uh, and I had no idea that the rich were stacking insurance like that to really yeah. protect their wealth. And, totally. and I, I see it now, you know, after going through what I've been through. Yeah, I, I get that 100%. Yeah. So it's very important for people to realize that. Uh, 100%. You, you, mentioned, you mentioned that billionaires pay less tax than most of us. How does that work? Well, knowledge is power. It's a great, it's a great comment. Knowledge is power. And knowledge is only valuable when it's used. So to know and not to do is not to know. Okay, so the wealthy get a financial education when they're young, and they give their kids a financial education when they're young as well. And the wealthy have multiple financial advisors. You know, it's 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 my job just to convince people just to get one financial advisor. But the wealthy, the wealthy have an advisor for real estate, for taxes, for um, in investments, for mortgages, for uh, their businesses. You know, they they got an army of advisors, right? Because they know they don't know everything, and they know that it's worth it to pay someone a little bit to gain a lot, right? They they're they're very they're very studious. They're very open that way, and they they like to delegate and they like to outsource, and they know that they don't need to know everything. They just need to know a little bit about a lot. The insurance protection for the wealthy, mm -hmm. they always plan for that for sure. How how? How many planners does it take to plan yeah. your finances, really? I mean, right, you yes. think one guy should know yeah, it all. Yeah, great question. Great question. No, be, so this is a great thing is, um, you know, like I said, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, right? And mm -hmm. as I said, you know, those who know and do not do, they do not know. So why they have so many different advisors is because they value specialization, right? We are not taught about specialization and the value of specialization in, in school or as we're growing up. My specialty lies in insurance, investments, and education. So I educate people. That's one of my gifts and specialties is to educate people on the system, right? My, my areas of mastery are not in real estate, Right. And they're not in gold and silver, precious metals. They're not in GICs or, or you guys call them uh, GIAs, I think. Um, and they're not in uh, stocks even. Right. Or mutual funds. Right. I love investments and I, lo I have like a general view of, of investments in, in Canada. The investing rules are kind of different from it. in America. We've got uh, what's called TFSAs and RSPs. You've got 401ks and IRAs. They both work exactly pretty much the same and they're pretty much the same products, but our kind of verbiage will be a little different. But your question is why do they have so many different advisors for so many different things? Because they value specialization. I'll tell you a story. You and I, we go to a GP or a general practitioner or a general doctor. The general doctor might make $100,000 a year and they work six days a week, and they have um, you know a staff and all that stuff. A specialist, there's a there's a shoulder surgeon in America who does a very specific type of shoulder surgery. He makes about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars per surgery. He does two a day, and he works four days a week. He doesn't have a whole set of staff. He just has like you know, two or three hospitals that he goes to to perform this surgery. And he's booked out like two years in advance. So in other words, if you're looking for a general opinion, you go to a GP, general doctor, you're going to get a very general answer. If you have a very specific condition and you need a very specific solution, yeah. you go to a specialist, right? So it's a great comment you made about, well, isn't one financial advisor enough? It could be. For most people, it probably is. But if you're dealing with millions and millions of dollars of wealth or even billions of dollars of wealth, which the one percenters are, and there's even 0.1% who's even got more than that, 
um, then you need specialists, you need specification, you need specialized information on those specialized areas. And believe it or not, believe it or not, too much money is a problem, right? Too much money is a problem. So you need to have advisors on these specific areas in order to protect your wealth and grow your wealth in these specific areas as well. So I hope, I hope that answers your question. No, that's very good. Actually, that laid it out very well. Uh, it's interesting. What point of income should you actually start thinking about multiple advisors? That's a that's a great question. I would say over about one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year, probably in income is a good idea to start to specialize and diversify because then you might diversify, right? You've maxed out your uh, 401ks and, and, and limits, I guess, on your IRAs and things like that, uh, TFSAs and RSPs in Canada, or you've really mastered, say, stocks or uh, and you'd like to start to get into real estate or you start to like to get into Bitcoin or cryptocurrency, then you want to talk to different advisors in those areas. With mortgage rates increasing, with the interest rates increasing from the banks, all over the world, a mortgage specialist is essential if you have, and a credit specialist is essential if you have multiple properties, multiple locations, because then you might want to refinance and renegotiate, get a new term for the different properties that you have and lock them in for certain years. And those are bigger decisions because you've got properties in the, in the you know, hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars in value. Your earlier question about taxes, uh, how do billionaires... How do the 1% the wealthy pay less tax is through knowledge because it's perfectly legal to pay no tax. It's perfectly legal to pay as little tax as possible. The more you know about the tax system and the tax code, then the less tax you pay, period, end of story. Absolute period, end of story. Because in this case, especially knowledge is power. Yeah, and you actually started off with that where, you know, you actually need to take that action. So what what do you think about credit cards and how should people handle and maintain credit cards? How many should they have and what's the best type to have? Yeah, credit cards are a tricky one because it's kind of, it's kind of like a blessing and a curse. Here's the funny way that credit works. The more you have that you don't use, the better you are. <laughs> you know, the more credit you have that you don't use, the better off you'll be, the better your credit score will be. So you'll have a higher credit score and access to more credit if you have it and you don't use it. <laughs> it's very funny. Interesting. And the more credit you have, the higher your score is, the more credit they want to give you. Right. Yeah. So the, it's like when you don't need money, they'll give it to you. When you need money, they're less likely to give it to you. Interesting. So in a way, yeah. all credit cards are good because if you if you get them and you don't use them, then your credit's just going to continue to rise. Your credit score is going to continue to rise and you're going to get access to more and more credit. But if you have it, you know, they give it to you and you think, oh, I got five thousand dollars now. Well, you don't. You got basically an option to use $5,000 that if you use, oh, yeah. they're going to they're gonna charge you an arm and a leg for it. So credit can be a blessing and a curse. It can be a dangerous thing. You know, it can be a very good thing if you are disciplined and you choose wise investments to leverage, to use that credit in order to make you more money. But it's dangerous because if you have it and then you use it and then you don't pay it back, then those interest rates can be atrocious. And you can rack up debt that way. So it would actually be better to like take a loan out for a car or something like that to build your credit? Yeah. Loans are good because they help you build your credit. And if you make payments reliably and consistently, then it proves that you're a good um, debtor, right? You're, you're a good um, person who can manage debt well. So then, you know, they'll give you more credit potentially. Whether it's a car loan or a credit card, you know, card, credit cards can be really dangerous because this little plastic thing that you, you know, think like, 
it gives you money instantly, but can be a trap. But uh, always, always, always shop around for the best rates because they're all willing to compete for your business. So yes to the car loan, yes to the credit card if, if it's right, but also shop around and make sure you're getting the best rates. The lower the rates, the better, obviously. Yeah, I wish I knew that earlier about credit cards. You know, I, I don't really use the credit card too much. Uh, I just would rather pay cash. It's mm -hmm. saved me a lot of headache because of those traps. And yes. if you don't read the fine print in those those contract details, it really can yes. bite you hard. Yeah, and some of them have annual fees. Um, you know, 50 bucks, 20 bucks or a hundred bucks. And then some of them give you rebates or cash back. And, you know, a lot of those things give you points for travel and then people don't use them. So best to shop around, get, get cash back, get high percentage cash back cards. We don't have that many in Canada, but in America, in America, man, you guys have, you, you have a lot, you, you have a lot of high percentage cash back credit cards. Everybody should have those, you know, 3%, 5%, 6% cash back easily interesting so uh how do we get people this is a trick question how do we get people to start saving and thinking about all of this before it's too late well the best time to take action was yesterday that'll always be the case yes. you know um right now is a great time to start investing because because of covid and the ukraine war and everything the interest rates are low and well, actually, no, sorry, interest rates are high, they're going higher, but the stock market is low. I personally believe we're going into a recession if we're not already in one. And they just they just haven't announced it yet. So I'm preparing for 2023 to be another year of dips in the markets, which is a great time to invest. You know, Warren Buffett says, be fearful when others are greedy, and be greedy when others are fearful. So interesting. He, so he is getting ready to be greedy because everyone's so fearful. And you can actually Google, uh, you know, there's an index, the fear and greed index. So it's like a it's like a speedometer. You can measure where we are on the scale, where people are right now, whether they're in fear or greed or neutral or extreme fear and extreme greed. And those are the times, the best times to take action. So I watch uh, Bitcoin and crypto very heavily because I know that it's the future. And it's just a superior technology than what we have now. So I'm very, very, you know, excited and interested in, in the crypto space. And I have been for about five years. And so right now we're in extreme fear. So I'm excited to buy and keep buying and start buying. And I think stocks will go to um, more dips this year, which will be great time to buy. So how do you know what type of investments to get into? Yeah, either you're going to work with a financial advisor and let them do the research and tell you, and you're going to let them show you some options that you can pick, or you're going to do your own research and you're going to read your own books and blogs and find your own information and pick one. But ultimately, the best investment will always be in yourself because you can produce unlimited dividends. You can produce unlimited returns on, on yourself and you can make as much money as you want, you know, from yourself, right? So if, for example, if you take, if you get a new skill that can make you an extra 20 or 30 grand a year, then you can do that every year from one investment from that skill. So the best investment will always be in yourself, but you know, everybody has their different choices. There's precious metals. People are really into there's real estate, there's crypto, there's stocks, there's bonds, there's all kinds of stuff. You got to figure out and determine where your appetite is or where your risk uh, tolerance is and ultimately go with what you know or pay someone else to do it for you. So risk management is really the key there. You, you study your risk and you manage it. Yeah, you study what you're willing to tolerate. You know, like crypto has a great, Crypto is the highest risk asset class right now, but it's also the highest ROI return on your investment right now. But it comes with great risk. You know, a lot of people got into this exchange or this coin or whatever their friend told them about this and they just did it. I know people that just dumped $10,000 into just some thing people just told them about because they said it would make them 100% in a year. 
well, there's very few investments on planet Earth that will give you 100% in a year. And there's even less that have stood the test of time. So you got people, I think, don't do enough research and they don't work with enough financial advisors, which is why there's, you know, the statistics that, that people are in, you know, 90% of people at age 65 are still working or having to work 90%. That's, that's not an accident. That's through lack of planning, lack of preparation and, and lack of proper guidance or counsel, right? More people need to have financial advisors and, and more people need to work with professionals who, who are accredited, who are licensed, who are, you know, have the right intentions and have the results and success and history to back it up. So what what's the best suggestion to find those individuals? How how do you reach out and find the individuals and know that they're going to be good fit for you? Well, hopefully a podcast like this, they meet great people like like, you know, and they get to hear great stories and they get to check for themselves if they're worthy and do their own research, check Google for reviews, go to the person's website, look for testimonials, look for uh case studies and references, do your due diligence, book a call, book a conversation, you know, my website, you can book a call with me anytime and uh, have a complimentary 30 minute conversation. And, you know, I'm, I'm traveling Mexico and I'm enjoying my life because of investment decisions that I made, you know, five, 10 years ago. So ideally they have the results as well to back it up, which in my case, you know, I'm pretty comfortable. I, I have that kind of freedom. So Take your time, research, do your due diligence, talk to them, look for, you know, everybody's on YouTube these days or Instagram. And don't just look for the flash, look for the results, the, the testimonials, the case studies. Just talk yeah, to people. Yeah, that due diligence, that's for sure. So what what got you into being like this other than your parents? Because yeah. usually it, it would appear that, we try to flee from our parents' direction. <laughs> and here you are, you dug in and got it right. What, what, how did that happen? Yeah, great question. I, I did, I did rebel at first. <laughs> I, I did okay. rebel, you know, as all good children do, I did rebel. My, yes. my, my parents wanted, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, my mom wanted me to be a priest when I was young. You know, we were very Catholic. We grew up in a very Catholic Christian family. So she thought I'd be a great, you know, priest or something like that. My my parents worked in the banks, which means that they were employees, even though they worked in finance in the banks. They were still employees. So I followed their path till I was about 25. I wasn't in finance, but I was a employee and I worked really hard and I had a great job and I climbed the ranks and different, you know, corporations and businesses and uh that served me very well and then I, when i was about 25 i went on this huge personal development journey and just took this big turn and and dove into gaining skills and and abilities and unlocking my own personal you know sense of self in in ways that i never imagined before and that took me you know down like a 10 year journey and partway through that journey i realized i didn't want to work for someone else i wanted to work for myself I wanted to make my own hours. I didn't want to have a limit on, you know, how many people I could help or how much money I could make. And so I started a couple of businesses and bailed and floundered. And as most first business owners do, I didn't know what I was doing and I didn't know what I didn't know. So my first couple of businesses failed and they deserved to because I did not know what I was doing. And I had a ton to learn. So I scraped my knees, you know, wasted a whole ton of my savings and, uh, wasn't a waste because I learned important lessons. And then eventually after, after a few years, I started to get the hang of it and picked a, picked a, a right business and a good business and found some mastery in a niche and started to do well, started to you know stand on my own two feet. And that was about, man, I guess, where are we now? Time flies, 2023. That was about almost nine years ago. And I did that business for about uh, five years or so. And that was essentially matchmaking. So where I'm from in Toronto, in Canada, lots of single people, lots of frustrated single people. Um, and then there was a gap in the market of like quality uh, dating events and singles mixers and ways to match and meet people. Big city, big entertainment, big nightlife, but you know, 
lot of uh, phony stuff with the bars and whatnot. So I had a good business there for several years. And then I met my, um, my then wife at the time, who I thought would be the love of my life for the rest of my life. She wanted to be a client and I kind of took her and stole her for myself. And um, we checked off each other's boxes in all ways. And, and, and I did that business for, for about five years. And, and uh, I thought that would be, that would be it, you know, and um, along with her came three kids. She had uh, uh, been married before. Uh, he died prematurely. He was in his 40s. He died of a heart attack. And they had no life insurance. So she had to go out and work and make money and put food on the table for her kids instead of grieving. You know, instead of taking that time to grieve, had they had a life insurance policy on him, then, you know, she would have had several hundred thousand dollars to just relax and just grieve maybe take the kids and travel. This is before COVID. And they didn't have that. So I met her a couple of years later. They were, they were separated anyway, but uh, uh, I met her a couple of years later and this story really touched me. And I remembered my, my personal finance upbringing. And I knew that if we were going to be together, then I was going to be, you know, the breadwinner or income provider for the kids and her in the household. So I looked back on my foundation that my parents gave me with that financial education. And I was looking for a bit of a change anyway. And I said, what about personal finance? What about being a financial advisor? So I found a really great company, found a great mentor and, and made the change. I made the pivot and I decided to use my knowledge that my parents gave me and that foundation and combine it with the products and the investments and the insurances that I was able to sell and offer and share with people to help get them to where they wanted to be. And um, I've been in it since basically, it's been about four years and I've been in it since. And then we actually just divorced because of COVID and all that stuff. We had some differences and we just actually just divorced just recently about, uh, about about seven months ago. That's unfortunate. So, it is. I'm still in contact with the kids though. And I'm still uh, part of their lives and I still have investments for them. And I bought the insurances for them and for her and still pay for it. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's unfortunate that that's the way that worked out, but uh, I'm still in touch with them and I'm still passionate about helping families just, to prevent what she went through and what the kids went through. Very big, important. You know, uh, I wish more people would just think about that. It, it, it's amazing. So tell us what, what type of schooling had to go into being a financial planner besides what your parents instilled into you? Yeah, there is a course. I mean, it's different for every state and province uh, in Canada and America, but there is a couple courses you need to take, pass your tests, uh, study for maybe six to eight months, uh, four different uh, tests or more to pass. And then there's more license that you get a license, obviously, for your state or your province. And then uh, there's even more licenses and degrees and certifications you can obtain along the way as well. But the basic one is about six to eight months and um, provincial or state state license you need to pass as well. Interesting. All right, Michael, do you have a call to action for our listeners today? Absolutely. I'd love to speak with people if they're open and they're looking for financial help or financial guidance. I've got a lot of online courses available at truefinancialeducation.com, www.truefinancialeducation.com. A lot of well-priced, reasonably priced courses there people can take and learn. And then if they just want to get into action, get serious and get help, then they can talk to me as well at michaelsantonato.com. And is that the best way to get in contact with you is through that website? Yeah, they can book a call with me in my calendar there right away. Michael, it's very important what you're doing out there. And I love that you're out doing it on podcast, helping educate unfortunate people because the world is in need of education right now and we are lacking that self education you you stated it very clearly take time and invest in yourself it's the biggest takeaway of today's topic so thank you so much for sharing with us and being part of the dead america podcast thanks ed i appreciate it man it's great to talk to you 
thank you for joining us today. If you found this podcast enlightening, entertaining, educational in any way, please share, like, subscribe, and join us right back here next week for another great episode of Dead America Podcast. I'm Ed Waters, your host. Enjoy your afternoon, wherever you may be.